fine with previous experience. And I also think that from what I see here in China that Tai Chi is obviously more than just about fighting, is more like a lifestyle here. Yes. Uh, tai Chi, it's uh, from what I observe being in China, it's a warranty of well-being. It's, um, it gives us confidence that we can live a long, healthy life. And also it's a way of socializing. It brings people together and they create a communion. They go out together. They, uh, they become friends. They share everything. And it's wonderful. Yes, since, since you mentioned bringing people together, actually in China, every evening, there's a lot of activity happening in community squares or in parks. So for example, in my community square, there is Tai Chi happening. There is a lady with the sword. And then there's a group of ladies who are doing the fan dance. That are, that's that are also part of the Tai Chi practice, fan and sword. There you go, there you go. Then there's a bunch of uh, parents hanging out with their children. But you're, you're right, people are coming together to practice, as you said, communally, all, all these wellness activities. Exactly, exactly. And that's the beauty of it. Because as you can see, as you mentioned, the grace of the movement, Tai Chi practice was a, in a way idealized. They took the, the martial art techniques and they make it beautiful, may make it elegant. So the practice will achieve an, ex, an aesthetic purpose. And that mm. enhanced life in general. It's like a Japanese or Chinese garden, like a Buddhist temple. Everything is part of a beautiful image of a beautiful landscape. True, true. And, and, and it's, it's, it's also lovely to watch. Like I almost every morning I stand out in the balcony and I just watch the, um, my neighbors downstairs practicing Tai Chi. And now it's very cold, by the way. Like in the morning is like three, four degrees and they still continue practicing, which is unbelievable. <laughs> the school I was uh, practicing, uh, they practice all year round. And I remember uh, I arrived with my friend the second day and the teacher was not there. So we called her, he called her. He followed the Chinese uh, politics rules. And mm -hmm. then the teacher said, I am not coming here only the days when that's a terrible storm. And previous to that, I will announce everyone. The school was, was having the activities always outside, winter, oh. summer, all year round. <laughs> that's the connection with nature. How can we be healthy? How can we exercise breathing techniques if we are inside in an enclosed uh, space where there's no fresh air? True, and since, since we mentioned morning trainings, so for the last almost two months, I've been preparing myself to face the cold of winter. So I lived in Thailand for 16 years and Thailand is a tropical country and it's hot all year round. When we moved to China, when me and my wife moved to China two years ago, we dreaded the first winter. We were literally afraid of the winter. And this winter, I told myself that I have to start training and preparing myself, both physically and mentally, not to be afraid of the cold anymore. It's, it's almost like a mental game. So I've been training now every morning before, before I, I start my work, uh, seven, eight o'clock. And I, you know, I find it difficult at the beginning because it's like four degrees outside, right? And you have to start moving and uh, warm up. But it is a different feel to train outside in the open than to train, you know, in a room or in a gym. So I, I totally uh, connect with what you're saying. It's been so long, so I don't train in a gym anymore. 
uh, I find it very natural to be outside, to, to have the, all the activities outside. But yes, yes coldness, yes. as you mentioned, it's, uh, it's a fact. So I don't think, uh, I think that it's present and we have to take it in consideration. I am, we are exposed here in Canada to a much more uh, bitter temperatures and, <laughs> and a longer winter. So I think beside the fact that we have to be mentally prepared, uh, we have to be also physically prepared and to protect ourselves. The sure. Chinese, they do that. They have a special food for winter, special tea, and of course they dress warmly for- uh, Yes, yes, true. And speaking of Chinese uh, customs and methods, they also recommend drinking hot water. So maybe this is a, a funny thing. Uh, anytime when anyone is sick, any of the foreign teachers at school is sick or feel a bit low or and any, any issue you might have, every Chinese person would say, drink more hot water. And you know that I've, I've gotten used to drinking more hot water. And in the winter, it's just great. Which is uh, highly beneficial for health. In yoga also, it's uh, recommended to drink water that's around the body temperature. So our body temperature being 36, the, the, the optimal water temperature will be four degrees around, like plus or mm. minus, like 40 or 30, between 40 and 32, that will be right away absorbed into the blood. And uh, it's true, true. And I, at first coming from Thailand where we always drank ice water because it was so hot, and to make the switch to um, to drinking hot water, I know for some it sounds silly, like oh, so why is this such a big of a problem? Well, it was a habit drinking cold water, ice water, and now it has be, it has become a habit to uh, be more mi more mindful and you know follow more of the Chinese uh, concepts when it comes to wellness. This is a wonderful way of adapting to a new environment. And since you mentioned earlier China and the public spaces, the public square, what do you think it's uh, fun to do in Beijing? Uh, in your perception, how do people they entertain? It's a very good question. Now, considering that we're all in this special time of quarantine, social distancing, problems with the coronavirus, uh, Beijing has basically anything you can imagine. So when we moved from Bangkok to Beijing, we were worried that we will not find some of the things that we used to like, like going out and doing sports and going to museums, going to art galleries. It is just amazing how many things you can do in Beijing. And we are not, we're not party people, so to speak. Uh, we like to do, you know, we, we like to immerse ourselves in this new culture. So some of the things that I do right now, well, apart from eating out. So I think uh, Chinese people like to eat out a lot. And since we were in, in quarantine and at home for so long, now it's a pleasure to go to a restaurant and be served food and not have to, to cook your own food. And there are plenty of restaurants and types of food you can taste in, uh, in Beijing or throughout China. So I think maybe that's the, the best, um, um, the, most, the most favorite pastime of, of people in China, going to restaurants. And I also think they like, um, the Chinese people like going to the cinema a lot, uh -huh. especially watching movies in 3D. And... Uh, it's, it's very weird. I don't really like the 3D movies, but you know, it is what it is. And another thing that is no longer as available as it was before, Chinese people used to go to KTVs, karaoke TV. Oh yes, oh yes. Which is like, it, it's amazing how in Asia people like to sing in public. But uh, I was thinking of joining uh, a few, a couple of times with my friends to a KTV, um, you know, booth. It's a good way to practice the language. If, you, if, you, if you're learning Chinese and you want to sing a Chinese song, you can just read the subtitles and follow with the music. 
So that's great. But now they're kind of closed because it's, it's difficult to have social distancing when you're together with friends. But what we do uh, in, uh, in Beijing for fun, I don't know if people consider this fun, uh, we, we want to try Chinese things, you know? So I'm doing calligraphy, I'm, I'm taking um, uh, ink brush painting, the Chinese, Chinese ink brush. We go to temples or parks and we try to like identify the elements of a park. You know how the, the Chinese gardens are very elaborate and they have their feng shui and the gates and the lake and the bridges. And it's just beautiful to just go and discover and then we come back home, we read a bit more about it, and then we go to another park and say, like, oh, so this is what this means. So we like to explore, basically. And there are so many museums in Beijing. And then there's downtown. Actually, Beijing has more than one downtown. But downtown Beijing, there's like the bar area where you can go and hang out with friends. And there's also the financial district where they have all the huge skyscrapers. And it's just beautiful every day, any time of the day, every, every season. So, you know, if you come to Beijing, you would find something that you would like to do, for sure. For sure, for sure. And from all this uh, wonderful experience that you brought to us, could you tell us a memorable story that happened to you and uh, it marked you or uh, it's fun to share with us? A memorable story in, in Beijing, let's say, or in or or in uh, or in or in Thailand. So usually in my in my teaching style, I like to show the students that whatever I ask them to do, I can do. So, for example, in Thailand, I was teaching Asian history, and we reached the uh, we were we reached a chapter on the history of China, and I realized that the students did not know the names and the capital cities of their own provinces in Thailand. Sorry, uh, the history of Thailand, not China. So I told them like, how come you don't know the, the names of your, your, your capital cities? So the students said like, do you know them? And it was, it was a very good point, right? So I yeah. said, all right, next week, I take the test with you on all the capital cities of all the provinces in uh, in Thailand. And it was good, the students got really competitive because there are like 60 something provinces and the names are, are quite difficult and long for someone who's not used to the language. So maybe it's not a, a funny story, but it's like a, an anecdote say, in which I'm trying to say that through my teaching practice and my teaching philosophy is not to try is always to try to connect with the students on a level where there's an understanding between both me as the teacher, but as them as students too. I see, I understand. And how it ended the, the competition with the names and the provinces? It, it ended well, but um, the names are difficult to spell for us. It's true. So uh, they won. They won, and I was very <laughs> glad that they could spell the names of, of their provinces better I than I I know their name, yes. Uh, one of my friend's <laughs> family name was uh, Homsu. No, I am, if uh, I remember. Well, but so. I'm doing similar, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing similar things here in China, where, you know, China is such a big country, and I think coming from a Romanian, um, educational system where we learn quite a lot of geography and history. It's easy for us to find places on the map. Yes. But if you take just the map of China, it is not easy to find provinces that sound almost the same or like other rivers apart, the, apart from the two main rivers. So I am, I am working now with students and with, you know, whenever we, we have a, a fun game, a fun activity, where I give them the chance to teach me something new about the geography of China. Although I don't teach uh, history anymore, I only teach psychology, but that is a way of me to engage the students and tell them that even at my age, at 42, I am learning new things and I can also learn from, from the students too. And that, you know, that motivates them to see that they can also be, you know, 
on the other side of the platform be mini teachers? 